This nation was not built on cowardice. This nation was built on courage and on faith and on people who actually believed that there could be something greater than ourselves. So when we talk about this blessing on this country, and you hear almost every president almost will say, and God, when he finished talking and pontificating, and God bless America. Really? Well, God might bless America again when we as a people decide that our government, and I don't care if you're red, blue, orange, green, I don't care what you are, that our government is not truly for the people, and there's only one that's for the people, and that's God. And how tragic that even the currency that's about to be erased and eradicated says, in God we trust. The question for the multitudes is, do we actually trust God anymore? And if we trust God, why are we leaning so hard on the arm of the flesh? For those people just uh, tuning in today, we have the patri patriarch Jacob, who has children. Part of his children, of course, is his, his first and beloved son. I say first as in beloved, the son he almost didn't have, Joseph, who is sold by his brothers into the caravan of Ishmaelites that take him to Egypt and sell him into slavery in Egypt. Jacob, who is Israel, believes his beloved child is dead. The brothers of Joseph conspired. We know that eventually there's a famine in the land and all of the family will venture to Egypt trying to get food. It's really towards the end of Genesis that Joseph basically makes himself known to his brethren. And we have this final chapter where Jacob, who is Israel, the patriarch, is going to adopt Joseph's Egyptian-born children. And this is where we're at, we're looking at. Last week we began, it's kind of, they're, they're woven together. Ephraim and Manasseh are the children of Joseph, born in Egypt. And why this is important, because Jacob, who is Israel, adopts these children, and he doesn't adopt them as grandsons. He adopts them as his own children and basically puts them in that first position so they are recipients of the birthright blessing package. So that's very important because people say, well, I don't understand. He had all these children, and these two are born in Egypt, and how come they get this special treatment. Well, all you have to do is know a little bit of the fact that obviously Jacob loved Joseph, and Joseph was now kind of, we'll call it, out of the loop being in Egypt, so his sons basically get that place. They also replace the firstborn, and actually it would be Reuben and Simeon. There's a whole line of disappointments there. So these two children basically replace the firstborn, the actual firstborn children, taking on the role, if you want, of primogenitor, the, the law of inheritance by way of the firstborn, even though they are not the firstborn of Jacob, Israel's children. So what did we end up with? And count these with me, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Gad, Asher, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, and then we've got Ephraim and Manasseh. That actually makes 13, not 12, 13. You can count them for yourself. Now, a lot of times people tend to miss this because Joseph, you'll see in some of the writing, Joseph is included in some places as a tribe later, but it's really, it will be always Ephraim and Manasseh. So why I bring this up is because when we look at these 13 tribes I just listed, and we haven't looked at all of them, we've looked at most of them, um, but 13 becomes an important number, especially on the subject of Manasseh. And if you remember, we looked at Ephraim, and I said to you, Ephraim, company of nations, we identified it with Great Britain, the United Kingdom, England. Um, Manasseh, as I said, there's a connection that is 
if you don't know how to connect it, but there is a connection, Manasseh, to the United States. And unlike other tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh are unique. Unlike other tribes that basically went somewhere, I use the tribe of Dan as the obvious one, that start out through Turkey and on through Greece and Ceylon and basically eventually make their way to the British Isles and eventually settle in Ireland. The Tuatha de Danann settles in Ireland. We can say they left their name in a lot of different places, but they settled there. The tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh are different because although we know that they were allotted territory in the land, when it comes to territory, unlike all the other tribes, we're going to start looking at and seeing a collective body. So in Ephraim, we saw as they began to move west, we've got, we'll call it factions or subgroups that are picked up along with Ephraim. And basically, as the British Isles begin to take shape, you've got a lot of, we'll call them sub-tribes or clans that are scooped up inside of Ephraim that become England. And I pointed out that we get the word England from the development of the Hebrew word, Engeli, which comes to Angle, French, Angleterre, Angla land, etc. When you get to Manasseh, here's the complication. As I said, just like Ephraim, you've got to go deeper and you've got to dig a little bit more. But I, I don't think it's an accident. We're looking at uh, Manasseh, and I said the number 13 becomes important. So if we're attaching Manasseh to the United States and the symbolism and the numeric value of things, um, I'll just point this out because this, this deserves probably a whole message on its own. But if you've ever looked at our currency, dollar bill specifically, the Great Seal has a number of sets of 13 on it. Uh, the pyramid, for example, which has 13 steps. Um, you've got the eagle with 13 leaves and 13 olive berries. The left talon holding 13 arrows. Um, the bars and stripes, 13 representing the original 13 British colonies. You've got 13, is, it just keeps reappearing. And the symbolism is there unmistakable. And you might say, well, you're looking at these in this order. Well, Manasseh actually happens to come out to be the last, if you will, although we haven't looked at, I believe we've not looked at uh, Levi, Judah, maybe have missed one there, but Manasseh would be, if you want to call it, the youngest in developing, and that we are as the United States of America. So as numbering 13, and you can see, I don't, I don't, I can't tell you right off the bat, you know, everything is lined up perfectly, but the number 13, just look at our currency, and it's enough to tell you there's a lot there, including, by the way, there's inside, if you've read the dollar bill, E pluribus unum, 13 letters there. Everything is 13. There's the theme of 13. If you look carefully at everything that is on the front and the back of our currency, you see that the Founding Fathers had concepts. I believe a lot of them were biblical in nature. Some of them have multiple explanations, but I don't think it's an accident. What is interesting for me is, think of this. On our currency, why do you think the Founding Fathers felt it necessary to put in God we trust? There was a reason for that, that we should be known as not a pagan, not a heathen nation. How far we've come. Yes, indeed. So uh, that's just kind of background to say that there's a lot here. And I'm not even sure that an hour is enough for this. So I'm going to just try. And whatever we don't get to, I'll see if we can get back to it. But. Um, we were looking at Genesis 49 and the blessing that is spoken from Jacob, who is Israel, to Joseph in verse 22, 
Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over a wall. The archers have sorely grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. But his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel, even by the God of thy father, who shall help thee, and by the Almighty, who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breast and of the womb, blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. So there's a lot that's said there. And I really believe if we were to parse this verse by verse, you could definitely see a bifurcation for both Ephraim and Manasseh. So there is definitely, um, when it talks about, for example, the archers have sorely grieved him, shot at him, uh, but he abode in strength. We know that both Ephraim and Manasseh, and I want you to think not so much modern, but I want you to think at the time that basically the British had the largest territory with the greatest, at that time, military. You know, there's a lot that says, you know, that this particular group of people would possess the gates of their enemies. Well, again, that's why I'm not trying to separate too much Ephraim and Manasseh right now, because at one point, it was only England until we obviously became a nation, and that nation became a great military force, and I don't want to talk about modern times right now because that's a whole different story. But if we're trying to match up the biblical record, here's where the fun begins. So we've got to go to the genealogy to look up the family descendants of Manasseh. We'll find that grouping uh, in First Chronicles 7. If you'd like to turn there, First Chronicles 7, verse 14. And the sons of Manasseh, Ashriel, whom she bare, but his concubine, the Amorites, bare Machir, the father of Gilead. And Machir took to wife the sister of Hupim and Shupim. Imagine what those guys looked like. Here's Hupim and Shupim, whose sister's name was Machach. Say that a couple of times. And the name of the second was Zelophad. And Zelophad had daughters, and Maha, the wife of Machir, bare a son. She called his name Peresh. The name of his brother was Sheresh. And his sons were Ulam and Rahim. And the sons of Ulam, Bidan, these were the sons of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, and so on. So you can see there is the family line right there. Now, what is interesting about this group of people? Um, we know that the daughters of Zelophad are, are, we have their names in uh, Numbers 26. Uh, Mala, Noah, female Noah, Hogla, Milka, and Tirza. These names are actually important because we're going to see connections, again, to clans and tribes. Some of these are crystal clear. Some of these are a little bit more ambiguous, I'm telling you up front. Um, we know that when the Israelites were in the wilderness, before they entered into the Promised Land, we know that half the tribe of Manasseh decided to stay on the east side of Jordan. So that would be Machir, Gilead, and Jair would become known as East Manasseh, and the rest to the west. Um, the western portion of land allotted to the tribe of Manasseh was then divided into ten portions because of the male descendants that consisted of five families. And then the sixth family, which would have been all female descendants, and these each got a portion of land for inheritance. So this is all relevant because, as I've repeated over and over again, when the Assyrians begin coming down and deporting in waves, didn't happen all at once, but let's just say that 
the date starting point is at 740 and by somewhere around 720 it could be a little bit 718 the dates are kind of all over the map but somewhere in that ballpark we know that all of the northern kingdom for the most part save a couple of hubs were already carried away we also know from the records and i keep mentioning this because it will tie in with today's message specifically that in secular records these people who were part of the northern kingdom who were deported began to be known by different names and one of them bit humri and that is the house of umri umri was a king that reigned they were labeled like that. These people were from the house of Umri, Beit Humri, or Beit Humri. And eventually that would morph, by the way, the Humri would morph into Kimri, Simri, Jimri. So depending on where you were and how things were pronounced. But when I, when I say the name began to morph, we see it develop. And as people are migrating, we'll have groups of people whose names are so similar but off by one consonant or, or by one vowel pronunciation, but they are obviously one and the same people. If you recall, I was mentioning the people that are referred to as Saka or Saka Scythians. These are equally part of the Beit Humri, but known Saka Scythians, known as the sons of Isaac. And if you remember, there's a scripture Abraham says, in my seed, Isaac, right? So it is the sons of Isaac, again, just like the children of Israel. It's just another way of describing these people. So don't get confused. This is all referring to the same people known by different names. Saka Sunni, Saka, Sin, Saka Scythians, Scythians, Great Scythians, the Scythians of the East, the Scythians of the West, and then there are subgroups of Scythians. They pretty much all belong to the same people. And you've got to remember, as people spread out, we would find, for example, and I've already described this in another message, where we would find with very, very good evidence from DNA taken from teeth and bone remains to be able to trace who these individuals were. And all of those DNA records lead us back to that swath of land where these people were deported from. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. Um, so we, we know there are certain things, for example, about these different Scythian people. Have you want to refer to them, Saka Scythians? And there's, as I said, subnames. We know that they abhorred swine and the flesh of swine. Remember, I said to you, for the most part, these people have forgotten all of their traditions and all of their customs, but certain things for some reason stuck or got ingrained and just got perpetuated, and the swine thing is one of them. Um, we know from studying these people, this particular group of people were fair-skinned fair and probably um, light eyes, and most people wouldn't think that, they think, people heralding from a certain area, dark skin, dark hair. No, these were fair-skinned people for the most part. So um, here, here's the fun part. When we take apart the names of people, and I've shown you this every week, the daughters of Zelophad are pretty important. One of the daughters whose name was Noah, uh, her name is given to a city called Nauris, N-A-U-R-I-S, on the Don River. We know that is, it's attached to her. We know that for a fact. In that area, we find people called Nuri, N-E-U-R-I. These people are related and descendants of one of the daughter, daughters of Zelophad named Noah. Just kind of hold that thought because as I'm describing all these people, you're gonna see how this all comes together. We have another of Zelophad's daughters named Tirza. Tirza will become known to us as, check this out, Thursa Getai. You remember I mentioned the Masa Getai? 
the daughters and descendants of Tirza will be known as the Thursa Geta. And the, now you're starting to see names that really truly look connected, the Getai, Masa Getai, all of these Getai people, they're all connected. So after that, we have another name, Helek. And Helek is attached to the people called Huliacons or Hulisons. So you might say, well, what does this have to do with this? Well, this whole group of people that I just described could fit under a banner of, Scythian, of a Scythian subgroup called um, Amrigian. And this becomes important. These particular people lead you back to a direct descendant of Manasseh, Mahir. And these are basically, it's, I just did a family tree in reverse to show you all these people from this particular Saka Scythian group descend from one of the sons of Manasseh. So why is this important? Because we know when we analyze this particular group of people, they had perfected the art of riding horseback, warfare, military type advancements on horseback, creating, before there was really an organized military, creating a very powerful force that could invade and could do a lot of damage on a level that had not been seen before. So they have kind of this special identity. By the time of Alexander the Great, when we know that Alexander the Great conquered most of the then known world, these people that I'm referring to, along with the Masagetai, the, the um, Thersagetai, most of these people were not subjugated. They were not. Now, when Alexander the Great conquered, he conquered and subjugated. These people were not, and that becomes important. It tells you they had enough military might and power, and they could sustain themselves. So you we're beginning to see by about the time of Alexander the Great, these people have uh, incorporated military tactics, horseback riding, and perfected the art of warfare. It's kind of very interesting. The visual symbols attached to these people, eagle and arrow. Now you start to begin to see the connections to, we'll call it Manasseh markings, eagle and arrow which somehow coincidentally show up on our currency. Just try that on for size. Um, the great Professor Rawlinson identified a subdivision of the Masagetai, referring to them as the Khorasmi, and I think I referred to them last week or the week before. Why is this important? Because the Khorasmi, um, if you take the letters out of their name, the C-H-R, Rawlinson connected that to, again, one of the sons of Manasseh called Mahir. So it's almost like this one has more crystal clear pathways of identifying people and their clans than most of what we've looked at to date. Um, Herodotus wrote that it is in the wandering Scyth Scythians that once dwelt in Asia. Um, there they warred with the Mazagetai, East Manasseh, by the way, uh, but were not victorious, so they crossed the Araxaxes, entered the land of Sumeria, not Sumeria, but C with a C. Um, and what we have in this grouping of people becomes basically, again, moving and migrating westward, coming under the banner of Saxon territory. So as we begin to move, we begin to see these people are kind of caught up in that same migratory wave, but you have to remember that if Manasseh is identified with America, you've got to remember how late we come on the scene as a country. So everything is identified and clustered in Ephraim until there's a breaking free to form this nation. And that because, that's why I said this is very tied together. Ephraim and Manasseh will remain somewhat tied together and to try and dissect beyond this becomes a great challenge. Um, there is also a group we haven't looked at because this one is very controversial among scholars, and that's the Jutes. If you remember, I said to you the 
Germanic tribes, Anglo-Saxons and Jutes, were the invading Germanic tribes that essentially made up the very early dominance of England before it was England. The Jutes are a hard people to pin down. Now, to date, I've given you everything that is fact or I've dug into historical records. This one is my opinion, and I always tell you when it's an opinion. The Massagetai, their name also morphs, and if you look at the way Getai is spelt, it will morph into Geti, it will morph into Guti, Juti to Jute. So these people become part of the Jutes. As I told you, this is not like uh, definitive stuff here, but when you begin to look at it, you can see that there were no other invading tribes that we could identify as these people. Strabo said most Scythians from the Caspian Sea are called Angles, and that's Strabo writing. Ephraim, Dahe, those more to the east, Masagetai and Saka, but there are other names attached to the, here's now the name hyphenated, Saka Amirgo, or Amirgio, which eventually will evolve into a group of people that I mentioned last week. If you remember, before England becomes united, it had territories, all ruled by different kings. So you have areas that were unique to themselves with a ruling king. These people become the people of Mercia. And why this is important, they are known at first as Mercian Saxons, and we eventually begin to see these Mercian people, and the name begins to morph as well. So a people within the Mercian clan called Magon Sate, or Spale of Mercia, and the land of Machir, eventually becomes equated, all these people become equated with America. And it's mind-boggling because unlike other tribes where we can trace and we can look, we only have the names to go by. That's all we have. And following the migration of these names, which ultimately leads us to this country. Um, descendants of Gilead would become associated with the Galatai in Gaul, the Giladon in Wales, and the Caledonians in Scotland. So again, not a singular people, but think of it as scattering within scattering. Daniel Webster delivered a speech in 1851 that reads as follows. I'm not reading the whole speech, just a little bit, okay? From the mouth of the St. John's River to the confines of Florida, there existed in 1775 13 colonies of English origin planted at different times coming from different parts of England. That's all you need to know. A lot of people who, unfortunately, in this day and age, do not know the history of this country, which is quite tragic. You know, we just celebrate holidays or things go by, or you see it on your phone, as a, as a, especially for younger people. I don't know about you, but when I think about it, for example, the celebration of independence means more to me now than it's ever meant in my entire life, based on the things I'm seeing all around me. And that's why I keep saying, if we're, not, if we're not careful, the very reason why this country came into existence, it's almost like, for what was the point? Why did we go through all of these exercises? For what? To let it just go to hell in a handbasket, pretty much? Um, a large flux of people came from East Anglia to the Massachusetts Bay Colony between 1629 and 1640. Somewhere around 80,000 Puritans fled England because of religious persecution and what most people do not understand about this. By 1640, uh, a lot has happened in England and if you know your history, um, the time frame, it was the fact that these people, the Puritans, wanted to worship a certain way. They had certain, we'll call them uh, rituals or traditions that the Church of England would have greatly frowned upon, all right? So um, when we talk about religious persecution or coming here to have the right 
to worship as one wishes or desires. It's really important for us to not forget that. I think if I were to just put a period here and say, let me talk about something else for a minute, it would be just this. Because history, real history, real American history, is not being taught anymore. Because children growing up in this country don't understand something you know, so far removed as the English being here, the Redcoats, being on this turf and wanting to claim it and take it for their own. And we could have been just another part of the British Empire. But we became a country founded on incredible ideas that were basically inspired by God. And if you look and read a lot of the founding fathers in their writings, there is not one individual that contributed. They may have disagreed on certain terminology or certain particulars, but they had one focus. I wish we could actually get back to that mindset, that one focus. And for you parents, forgive me for saying this, but if you have children, the most important thing you can do as a parent, apart from teaching your children about God, is teaching them real history, not caricatured history, not whitewashed history. And you know, in this day and age where if you do find people teaching history, it, it's skewed, it's corrupted. People don't want to, you know, we went through a phase, I don't know if you remember not too long ago, where people were ripping down statues, Civil War statues. And, you know, I don't care how you want to look at that, but that just shows the depravity to rip down a statue that commemorates it. We're not saying what was right or what was wrong, but commemorating the individual or individuals who fought for this country or who fought for whatever they deemed was the right cause. And look at the people who tore down these statues. I guarantee you not one of them ever fought for anything in their life except maybe to get a raise at their barista job. <laughs> Let me ask you something. Those folks that came aboard what was first two ships and then ultimately one. You think that they came here squawking about equal pay? You think they came here squawking about equity? Do you think they came here complaining that the trip was so hard, so cold, so brutal, that most of the people that actually survived the trip barely survived on land? See, this is the thing. Maybe America needs to go through a brutal hardship. Way worse than 9-11. I don't wish it. But maybe that's what's needed to wake people up, to make people re recognize that we were formed. This country was brought into being because God was at the root of those people coming here to seek out a place to worship, a free place, a place that spelled eventually freedom and equality, supposedly, for every man, woman, and child. You find me another place on earth that in our Constitution alone, you tell me a place on earth that protects its citizens with the laws that we have that favors the citizens, favors people actually having the opportunity to better themselves. I'm tired of people saying, well, there's no more opportunities in this land. Well, maybe there's, it's called, maybe you have no motivation and no desire because the opportunities have not changed. The opportunities are still here. You know, somebody says, well, if I, if I had the chance, I'd do whatever. Well, who's stopping you? And please don't don't point fingers. It's always the same thing. It's like people in politics always saying, ah, you did it, never wanting to take responsibility. So what we have here in these people, back to my message, is we have many groups that become amalgamated, first under the banner of Ephraim, the United Kingdom, and then think about 
the birth of this nation as basically a breaking off from Ephraim, coupled with, as I said, those people that came from the Netherlands. So probably if we were to look, we probably would find descendants of Mahir within the group of people that came. It's just like that, usually God's providence and God's blessing and all these things, somehow conveniently they, they all come together. If we go back to the people I referred to, the Amerigian Siths, the tribe of Manasseh, if you will, um, as they migrated, their name also morphed to the Maracanda, the Maracay, the Maruca, uh, the Moringas, and then ultimately, as I said, Mercia, and, and then the Mercians, and ultimately we have that name that will come directly into the name which we become, America, the United States of America. Now, if you read textbooks, or if you've been educated in this country, most people would say that it was Amerigo Vespucci that the country is named after. It's interesting that that although that may be so, there is a person who lived in Bristol, a, a merchant who lived in Bristol in the 1470s. And within his village, people say his name was lent to America. His name was Richard Americk. I don't know. You can do it that whatever you want. Kind of interesting. However it came to be, here we are, right? Um, I love the fact that if you're a map person, in 1506, there was no map that said America or, uh, you know, we have so many incarnations of names before we become America, but the first map with the name on there is in 1507. I think that's pretty cool when you look at those maps. Uh, New Amsterdam, you see all these connections to the world that the people came from right there on the map, and I love as I told you, history is great, old maps are great, especially when you're looking at all of this, you can definitely see influence and imprint from these different places. Now we know on July 2nd, 1776, Congress voted to declare independence from Great Britain. I love the fact that if you go into all the little historical tidbits, like it took 17 days for Thomas Jefferson to uh, kind of hone the Declaration of Independence, but on July 4th, 1776, Congress voted to accept the Declaration of Independence, marking our independence. And I keep thinking to myself, every time July 4th passes, and especially reflecting on this last year, I wonder if we went into the street and we asked young people under the age of 20, what does it mean? What? No, I don't want to know. But this is the tragedy, because every child born in this country should be able to tell you what it means and should be able, see this is the thing, once history starts being eroded and not being told anymore, you don't have a reason. The reason becomes it's a family day, we're celebrating, we wave a flag, but how about this, we could have all been British. No thank you. So. Um, here's a novel thought for you as well. The foundation of the American government and its purpose, form, and structure are the Constitution of the United States. Think about that, that, that document that is so kicked around so often. It is the foundation, the form, and the structure of our government, and yet it is highly abused, parsed, uh, it becomes whatever you want it to be, except what the founders meant it to be, which is kind of very sad. The Bill of Rights and the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, 27 constitutional amendments in all. Tell me a country, again, you could say, well, this was all formed off of the same vein as the Magna Carta. Yes, absolutely, but you tell me a country right now modern country that has the protection for its citizens, you wouldn't know it by the way, but has the protection for its citizens, has the rights, the beautiful setting in which the founding fathers understood what we should be 
entitled to is our God-given right. Now, you tell me that what I just said sounds anything like any modern politics. It doesn't. We're so far away from it. There is no we the people, for the people, of the people. That does not exist. And I'm telling you something. I mentioned this last week. If Ephraim's name meant fruitful, Manasseh's name caused to forget or forgetful, and I believe, as I said last week, that we have. You know, there was a time, and I'm not going to tell you that I think certain evangelists were great or not great, but there was a time when people would hold tent meetings, even in Los Angeles. They'd put up a tent and people would come. People came to hear the gospel preached. People came to hear a message from this book that would bring conviction, that would bring understanding, that would bring them to a closer walk with the Lord. Now we have to have giant uh, meetings in stadiums, and we have to coerce people to come. We've got to lure them in with maybe putting a box of chicken under their seat or giving them a coupon to a fast food restaurant. You want to kill somebody? Give them a coupon to a fast food restaurant. Yeah, and you want to go see Jesus? Yeah, here, here's a coupon. But we've got to coerce people. We've got to tell people somehow that there's a reward for coming in. And yes, I'm going to be the first person to stand here and tell you, has there been some really bad abuse that scarred the church of Jesus Christ? Especially, let's not talk about anywhere in the, else in the world. Let's talk about right here. Absolutely. In America, absolutely. Where you have people that have profited, turned the church, which is an age-old problem, by the way, but I'm speaking now of the church in America, turned it into a prosperity house and turned it into uh, whatever you want it to be except what God designed it to be which is exactly what Jesus said and I'm I'm seeing the unfruitfulness even when people gather for a Sunday morning service somebody said to me well don't you think something's better than nothing I really have to think about that because if the something doesn't contain any concept of God's word of promise, any concept of God's plan, any concept of God's ways. No, I'll take the nothing. Better to have nothing than to have something that takes your mind away from what you're supposed to be looking at. And when I say unfruitful, you think about this. I know because within our Bible collection, I look at all the books, Bible specifically, that were printed in America. <clears throat> at one point, there were so many printing houses in America, specifically in the, the corridors of Philadelphia and Boston, where we had a lot of activity. Bibles were being printed. People were clamoring to get Bibles, to read, to educate themselves, to possess the Word of God for themselves, to enjoy for private devotion. And you tell me that we've actually made advances. With all the technology we have, we have people that are more concerned. I watched a video on social media. Um, they said, if your church doesn't do this, your church ain't cool. It was a very, very big, big sanctuary. And they had people suspended from the ceiling playing drums. And they were flying over the audience. And I was thinking, no. I was thinking I'm at the church of Cirque du Soleil, right? <laughs> and everybody can be a clown. But it's either that, and there are pockets of churches, this one, and there are other pockets where people are still preaching the gospel and still teaching the word of God. But for the most part, talk to anybody who says they go to church, Ask them what they learned on a Sunday, and they can't tell you because there was no substance to anything that was delivered. And that's why I mean unfruitful. If we cannot get the fortitude to stand with courage in our faith and stand strong, what's, what will the next generation do? What will the generation after that do? Because we're supposed to be the people they're looking to and looking at 
And yet, what I see is a lot of people who prefer to just not deal with this. And especially now, by the way, many even dedicated ministers are not reading the Bible out loud to their congregations for fear that they will be labeled as people promoting hate speech and racist. I have news for you. This word of God has offended people for hundreds and thousands of years. Don't think that today's generation is special. They're not. It's only that it's augmented more. And the Bible clearly tells us in the last days we'll have mockers and scoffers and people that are more interested in worshiping the uh, creature, more interested in worshiping what is tangible than worshiping the invisible God. And you tell me that we could be labeled once more perhaps fruitful. I'm going to tell you something. Unless this nation, I said this last week, I'll say it again, unless this nation comes to the point of repentance and not not the way people traditionally use that word, bawling and squalling and on your knees. No, that is not the definition, but turning from your ways, turning and following God. Unless this nation repents, we are on a downhill slope and it's just getting worse and worse. Now, I am, I'm encouraged because I do see people it's sparse, but I do see people standing and saying, I will, not, I will not be moved off of my Christian faith. I will not be moved away from my position of teaching or preaching. I, for one, stand here and say, I will not be moved from that because, you know, somebody said, well, what do you do if somebody says you, you're speaking hate and they put you in prison? Well, then you preach from prison and you preach in prison and you do whatever you can wherever you are and I'm tired of people making excuses and being cowards for the sake of whatever this nation was not built on cowardice this nation was built on courage and on faith and on people who actually believed that there could be something greater than ourselves so when we talk about this blessing on this country and you hear Almost every president almost will say, and God, when he finished talking and pontificating, and God bless America. Really? Well, God might bless America again when we as a people decide that our government, and I don't care if you're red, blue, orange, green, I don't care what you are, that our government is not truly for the people, and there's only one that's for the people, and that's God. And how tragic that even the currency that's about to be erased and eradicated says, in God we trust. The question for the multitudes is, do we actually trust God anymore? And if we trust God, why are we leaning so hard on the arm of the flesh? Listen to me. Now, time for me to kind of depart for a minute and say my two cents. We have been through a lot in the last two or three years as a country, as a people. Okay? And without making commentary on all that we've been through, there was something that separated everybody. And no, it's not skin color. I'm going to tell you, there were only two groups of people that became clear to me over the last two, three years of what's happened in this country. The people who had faith, the people who believe God's in control, the people who trust in the Lord and the people who lean on the arm of the flesh and run because they're scared to find something tangible to hold on to because the invisible God either doesn't exist or is not enough. Only those two groups of people. While most of America has been focused on skin color, which God doesn't care about, neither do I. While most people are focused on the wrong thing, if you really look at what I'm saying, the country is sorely divided into just two camps those people of faith and those people who do not have faith whatsoever. And the people who didn't have faith, they're the ones running in circles with panic and dismay and can't believe and don't understand. The people of faith, although may be confused about the events, were never confused about the outcome. God is still in control. And you might say, well, but you just said, what about this country? Well, we have become unfruitful. Don't, let's not be dishonest. Let's call it what it is. And if we could get back, which I believe we, we can, that's not a delusional statement. But it will require not just a Melissa Scott, it will require 
multiple pastors, multiple priests, multiple rabbis. It will require people, the people of faith, to stick to the subject of faith and to the building up of the body, in my case as a Christian, to the building up of the body of Jesus Christ, to strengthen and fortify God's people, to have the equipment that Ephesians 6 talks about that says basically, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, these things that are unseen forces. And this is what we're up against. Now, you're either on the side of looking unto him, or you're on the side of looking at something else. Now, if America can get back, and as I use the word to repent, to, to stop in your tracks and turn back to God, we might be able to turn this country around. We might actually be able to produce a generation of people for the future who actually care more about country than self, more about family than personal things or personal gain. This is part of the problem. And you could say, well, but we're, we're in the last days, so what does it matter? It'll matter right up until the last day. That's the point. And quitting, I'm sorry, for those of you who think, oh, well, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm too old for this fight. I'm too old to just sit back. I'll say it and I'll keep saying it. God hates quitters and God hates cowards. Look to this book and see how many people potentially were cowards until God did not let them out of their task. A Gideon hiding somewhere, trying to get his work done until it became clear to him God would be helping him. A Jonah who was given a commission to go somewhere but chose to go in the opposite direction, not wanting to be involved. And I understand human nature. Human nature says, I don't want to be involved. I don't want the conflict. I don't want the trouble. But if we all take that mindset, that's how we fall. And if we all stand together, and I know you could say, well, that's so cliche, but it's true. There is strength in numbers, and all you have to do is look at the flip side of the equation. What has permeated our country? Perversity, sickness of the mind, ideas that I don't know in my lifetime, I don't think I could ever come up with. And as I said, against our children, against men and against women, the tearing down of everything that God has established. So if we want to be called something other than unfruitful, it's time for us to get back to the real business at hand and the real focus at hand, and that's looking unto him, being in this word, and recognizing even the people that came here to escape, but they came here for the purpose of being able to worship. And that freedom, by the way, shouldn't be looked at as freedom, that they came here with freedom to choose then, oh, you know what, now that I'm here, could you imagine that? Now that I've made that tough trip and half the people that traveled with me died, eh, I'm not going to fight anymore. I'm going to see if I can't steal some corn from the Indians and just live off the land for a while. I don't need to do anything else. Like government handout, right? Just live off the land, don't do anything else. Instead, these people were the propagators and the spreaders and the mouthpiece to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ on this turf we now call the United States of America. So, if you think about it, go back to the beginning of all of this, when God began to scatter. And I said to you, there was a purpose in the scattering. Read Hosea and read what he says. They were once called, not my people. And he says, and there will be a day when they shall be called my people again. And that day will come, and it'll come in the near future, trust me. But it's going to come for those that will look to him. And I'm sorry for those people that think, well, I'll, I'll wait until that time comes and I'll make up my mind. It doesn't work like that. You are either in with God and looking unto him and trusting him, or you're on the outside looking in. I'm sorry, there's nothing in the middle. There is no gray area. You're either moving forward in faith or the gear that puts you in reverse and you're going backwards. That's it with God. So my prayer for this people, the American people, Manasseh, is that we find ourselves again as a people of God and we recognize how, at least spread the news to the young people, educate the young people that this country wasn't founded on July 4th for hot dogs and barbecues, although that's a wonderful thing. 
not dissing that. But what I am talking about is reminding people that we could have been just another people subjugated under something else. Instead, we, we won the lotto. We ended up as free people in a free country. And my, my deepest heartfelt desire is that we don't let that go. It's too precious. It's too precious. And if all you've got to do is look around the world. As I said, find me a country that has for its citizens what we have here. It doesn't exist. This is still the greatest country on earth. This is still the greatest place to live. And hopefully we will get our stuff together as a people. And something else for the American people to think about is a last but not least. Do you realize we have let the culture, media, and society rip us apart the greatest divide we have had in our history. Don't think it was in the 60s. Don't think it was at any other time. We are the most divided we have been with a purpose, by the way. There's a purpose to all this. If you can divide the people and keep the people divided, you'll always have uh, the constant tension, the constant fighting, and the eyes of all of these are not where they need to be. There is, there is an agenda. If you can't figure that one out, so I refuse to cooperate with that agenda. No, I'm not the person that's going to try and go and shake hands with everybody I meet in the street. But nor will society, the media, or anyone else fill me with hate so that I hate my neighbor for no reason. And I hate the person that's over there for whatever the reason because society's pressing me to do that. I'm sorry. That is not the Christian way. And if he want it straight from the mouth of Jesus, he said, you heard it, say to you, thou shalt not kill. But behold, I say unto you, if you hate in your heart, you're as guilty as a murderer. Now you figure that one out. We've become a society of bloodless murderers. Is that what God intended for this country? I don't think so. So this is why I say to you, this is pretty serious for me. Because as most of you know, it's why I play the anthem. I know what most people are saying, I don't want to hear the anthem, or people don't want to stand, or people don't want to whatever. I don't care. I will play it until it drowns out the ears of my enemies who keep thinking so ill of this country. And maybe it'll drown out the voices of silly people who can't figure out that there are cemeteries across this land with uniform markers on them. And those gravestones are the gravestones primarily of men and a few women who fought for this country, who fought for you and I to have the right to be here. These are the things that we need to keep in our minds, not these stupid subjects that bring no fruit, but sacrifices made for me and for you for us to enjoy our freedom. Do not let that slip away. Do not lose that message. And certainly, if you're if you're in agreement with me, at least take the mindset that there's somebody in your immediate circle. My guess is we all know somebody who's not well-versed on American history. We all have somebody in our group of people that, eh, eh, well. And maybe instead of sometimes talking to them about God, you might want to talk to them about history. That might actually be too embarrassing for them to say they don't know, but they could listen to you who do know talk about things that could help them understand what they are letting slip through their hands so easily. I pray for this country to get back to its moorings in God. And maybe, maybe before the paper currency actually slips from our hands, we might once more look at the currency and say, yes, indeed, in God we trust. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.